Today's Mass is the Mass of the Solemnity Celebration of uh, Saints uh, Peter and Paul uh, due to the, the location of the uh, of where the feast fell, it had to get moved all the way to, to this point in time in, the, in the, the month of July, and we, so we celebrate the solemnity today with the commemoration of the Sunday, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. But the, what I want to talk to you today about is the other feast day that that occurs on on this day. That is the the feast of Saint Elizabeth of Portugal. She is a most edifying saint and a great example for for all of us in the way of virtue of, of a person to living their lives. As basically all the saints are, of course, but but she made me think in particular about the good that we can do in following after her. On Friday I was very edified to see so many here for Mass, the first Friday. We had over 30 people here for, for the sacrifice of Mass on that day. People coming, spending their time to make, uh, to give honor to our Lord's Sacred Heart on that first Friday, to make reparation to, for the ills and the hatred returned uh, for our Lord's divine love that comes from His heart. And I couldn't help but think to myself, so much good done by that one simple day, so much good done for souls, and uh, that we had so many here that day. And I thought, that is exactly the same spirit that all of us have to carry forward again and again and again. It didn't surprise me that that many were here, but it was edifying nonetheless. You see, our prayers, our sacrifices, our masses and communions, those are the greatest gifts, the greatest things that we can do in our life. That's the greatest thing we can do to sanctify ourselves. It's also the greatest things we can do to obtain the desires that we have and the needs that we have in our lives. Most especially the conversion and sanctification of others around us. We all have plenty of people that we know and want to pray for. And today's saint, Saint Elizabeth, embodied that her whole entire life long. She was born in 1271 to the royal family of Aragon and was given in marriage at a very young age to Denis, who was the king of Portugal. And uh, she was handed over to him, or promised to him at 10 years old, but married him when she was 17. Um, and from her youth, she right away started practicing very good and building up very good practices of piety and building up really good habits. Every single day, she attended not one, but two masses every day. And they were high masses, both of them. And she prayed the entire divine office daily, fasted regularly, and performed other penances. With this on top of all of the other duties that she would have had as somebody in charge, you know, in charge of uh, a kingdom in that regard. And so, and she, and she practices her whole life long, continuing with it, and once becoming actually Queen of Portugal, she added to it, because she now had the means to do so, she added to it a constant care for the sick and for the poor, and a, and a regular almsgiving in that way. And it was through that quiet piety that she would have the greatest effect on all of those around her. Her husband, King Dennis, he was a pretty good king, but he didn't in any way share the piety of his wife. He didn't stand in her way. He you know, didn't think of it as, as bad for her to, to do those things, but he didn't follow in her footsteps at all. In fact, he lived a very sinful life and even had a, a number of children out of wedlock because he was unfaithful. And, but this, uh, and, and on top of that, he at times could give in to the, his basis of passions in, in, in that regard. One, at one point in time, he became extraordinarily jealous of his wife because he couldn't help but think that somebody could actually live a really good and virtuous life even behind closed doors. St. Elizabeth 
oftentimes implored many of the poor of Portugal at that time, and two of which she had taken in as pages, kind of assistance to herself. One of the pages was a very devout young man, and, and found in Queen Elizabeth uh, a, a similar sword that he could latch on to and, and be encouraged to practice piety to a greater degree, and so they would he would receive instruction from St. Elizabeth, he would accompany her to Mass regularly, assist her at prayers, and by doing so, he had gained favor of her because she was of a similar disposition in her life. Well, the second page was in no way faithful uh, to, to the practice of the faith, and when he saw that this first page, the good page, had the ear of the queen, he became extremely envious. And so he decided that he was going to put a stop to it because he wanted to, the, to have the, the ear of the queen. And so he calumniated the good, uh, the good page and told King Dennis that he had engaged in inappropriate behavior with the queen. Well, that being said, Dennis was enraged by that and he immediately thought that that page needs to die. And so he devised a plan to kill the page, who he thought was, was uh, behaving poorly, and he contacted a line with Kiln, Kilnson and told them that I'm going to send you a page boy, and when he arrives he's going to ask you about if you had finished the business that I had given you, and immediately just take him and throw him into the furnace. Well, the good page was sent out by the king and told, why don't you go and, and find out if the kilnsman had finished my, my, uh, my project. So he starts down the road, and as he's passing by one of the churches, he hears the church bell ring out, signaling the consecration of the mass. Being a very pious man, he immediately goes into the church because he doesn't want to pass by the church when he knows mass is going on, and he always made it a point to never... Uh, stay for only part of the Mass, but to, to stay for the entirety of the Mass, or at least the duration afterwards from when he happened upon a Mass happening at that time. So he went in and knelt down and began to pray along with the Mass. The king was very anxious about the, to hear that the, this page boy was done away with finally, so at some point along the way, after waiting a little while, he sends the second page, the evil page, he says, go make sure that the, the kinsman has taken care of a task that I had given him. Well, the, the evil page walks to the, the, the foundry and when he gets there, he's actually beaten the good page to, to the kinsman. And as such, when he arrives and asks about the king's task, he's immediately mistaken for the one that is supposed to die and thrown into the furnace. The good page finishes up his mass, comes out, and arrives at the kilnsman, asks if the task is finished, and the king, and the kilnsman said, "Yes, tell the king that I'm all done with what he's asked me to do." And so he returns back to the king and reports exactly that. Well, the king saw in that moment that great divine providence had taken place; that he was wrongly accused, and that the the proper evil page had actually perished in that. And he also realized at that moment just how virtuous his wife actually was, that, he, that God would so protect a page boy as to ensure that he understood the virtue of his wife. Now that's not to say that it changed him right away, but St. Elizabeth kept on praying faithfully for him, praying faithfully for all of her needs. She, she was always devoted and loved her husband, no matter how uh, sinful he was at times. And despite of his unfaithfulness, she always returned that with great kindness and a great sweetness towards him. They had two children together, a boy and a girl, and every day she would include all of them in their prayers at Mass, as well as for the entire kingdom. And of course, those prayers in the long run would bear more fruit. At one point, her son Alfonso uh, believed that, as a, he was an adult at this point, uh, he believed that his father was showing favor to one of the illegitimate children, and that he was afraid that that 
illegitimate child will be given the kingdom at his, when his father died. And so he began to build up his own following to the point that it eventually erupted into a civil war for power in Portugal. And soon those two factions, the father, King Dennis, and the prince, uh, Prince Alfonso, would end up being ready to face off in battle. Well, St. Elizabeth could not bear to see a civil war, let alone her own husband and son facing off in a battle for power. And so after spending much time praying for peace and a resolution, she mounted up upon a donkey and rode out to the battlefield. And thereupon arriving, the two sides were on the opposite ends of the field. She rode out into the middle in between the two forces and just sat there upon the donkey. She, her example at that instant was so profound and her piety and her prayerfulness couldn't help but affect both the sides. The king and his son Alfonso looked at, the, at the, their uh, wife or mother and in the center, and they were immediately touched by that example. And they put down their arms, and they began to talk, and they came to a resolution, and they made peace with each other, and the, and the, the battle was completely avoided and the illegitimate son sent into exile to keep the proper order of things inside the kingdom. Eventually, all that prayer and sacrifice were paid off in the king's soul as well. Towards the end of his life, he gave up on all of his old sinful ways that he had held on to so tightly for so long. He made a good confession. He began to accompany the queen to, to the masses that she would go to to, pr to to pray with her and she and eventually made a good end to his life, a soul gained for heaven by Saint Elizabeth. At the death of her husband, Saint Elizabeth retired to the convent of the poor Clares. She was a third order uh, Franciscan during her life and so as such when she became a widow, she decided that she would live out the rest of her days in the convent doing quiet, quiet prayer and sacrifice, her favorite thing in life. And it, but it wasn't meant to be all the way to the end. She once again was called out to broker peace. Alfonso, now the king, he was readying, readying for battle against his own son-in-law. He had married off his daughter to the, this uh, prince from Spain. And the, the prince had really treated that her, uh, his daughter, the, uh, Saint Elizabeth's granddaughter, very, very poorly, was constantly cruel to her, was very unjust. And at, finally, Alfonso could not stand by any longer, and so he decided that he would fight to defend the honor of his own daughter there. Well, again, Elizabeth, hearing that, rides out in similar fashion all the way to the battlefield, and again, is able to to manage to broker peace between the two factions. But that action will be the last great action of peace in her life. It took a toll on her, and it, it was a much longer distance to travel, and she was now older, and she fell ill because of it and died finally in the year 1336. Such good achieved for the kingdom of Poland by one woman. Peace is obtained. War was avoided on t at least two occasions. Conversion of many souls, including her own faithless husband, and an increase of devotion and holiness all throughout the kingdom all took place because of the quiet devotion to the holy sacrifice of the Mass of its queen, because of her faithful daily prayers and her her ready sacrifices that she made, and the quiet, sweet example of charity given throughout her life. It's such an important example for all of us. It's the footsteps that every one of us can follow. Now, we might not be able to make it every single day for Mass, of course, but it doesn't mean that we can't be completely devoted to that sacrifice of the altar. 
It's the month of July. It's time of the precious blood. And we have that same sacrifice that merited our salvation taking place daily upon the altars throughout the world. And when it's here and we're able to come, we're united intimately by that good communion that we make in our attendance and attentiveness to our masses. And when we can't be here, our spiritual communions show our Lord that we desire that same end nonetheless. And our prayers, regular and daily, are the greatest actions that we can do for souls. They're the greatest actions we can do for our own country. They're the greatest actions that we can do for any intention that we have in our life. And St. Elizabeth reminds us that charity, the virtue that our Lord calls us to, each one of us, the one that he puts above all of the other virtues, the, ones that, the one that encompasses all of the commandments and all of the virtues of God in and of itself. That example is exactly what will be the good example to others. All of those things, little pieces in the giant puzzle of the salvation of souls, little pieces in the building up of the kingdom of heaven, the individual actions, the singular prayers, aren't what are going to immediately cause the fruits to be apparent to us. But it's the collection of it, the, the steadiness in it, the faithfulness to them, and the regularity of them that eventually builds up exactly what God rewards us for, that consistency in our devotion to him, that returning the love that he's given to us by his sacred heart. That's the example of St. Elizabeth, and the example by which we all can live by, and know that it led her to paradise, it led many others to paradise, and it can be that same footsteps leading to paradise for us. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.